welcome to the Northeast Georgia History Center's Wednesday live stream. I am Marie Walker and I am the director of the Ada May Ivester Education Center here. And I am here today with author Denise Weimer. Hi. <laughs> and she is going to be talking to us about different uh, books that she has written through various time periods. Most of our historical fiction, historical romance, historical suspense, and uh, a <laughs> little mystery thrown in there. Uh, so we are going to be talking about those. But not only is author uh, Denise Weimer, well, an author, but she is also one of my friends that I met while doing historical reenactment and historical dance. That was us back in the day, about 10 years ago. <laughs> so it feels like it. <laughs> yeah, maybe eight years ago. Um, yeah, we had a mid-1800s dance group, and we performed all over the state and met Marie and her mom doing that. <laughs> yes, because I wasn't old enough to drive myself places. She was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from originally? And Sure. Well, I was born in Atlanta, and I grew up in Jackson County, so not too far from here. And since then, I've really lived all over the state, uh, mainly the northeast mm -hmm. part of the state. Which is great, since we're the Northeast Georgia <laughs> History Center. You've uh, yeah. A lot of the region that we talk about here are in your books. Yes. <laughs> all of my books so far are set in Georgia <laughs> from different time periods. Yes. So what was your upbringing like? How did you start to gain your love of history? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I grew up in the country, and I was an only child. And I know you'll agree that's not always a bad thing, no. right? <laughs> it could be a really good thing. Yes. Um, so I had parents who were big history buffs, and they took me all over the southeast to various cute little towns and historical sites. And I just had a really active imagination, mm -hmm. and I would start to wonder what kind of people might have lived there and mm -hmm. what might their lives have been like. Like. So before too long, I started making up stories about them. Mm -hmm. And then I started bringing spiral bound notebooks, <laughs> notebooks in the back seat of the car. And I would write these stories down mm -hmm. and my mom would very patiently listen to them. <laughs> they would ramble on forever, <laughs> but she told me to keep writing. So oh. that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> when you graduated from high school, you went on uh, to college. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience there and how that uh, went into your, your writing. Sure. Um, well, back when I was selecting a school, a lot of them only had an English degree or a journalism degree. Mm -hmm. So I knew I did not want to teach, so I went with the journalism major. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then they said I pretty much would have to write for a newspaper before mm -hmm. I could write for a magazine or publish a book. Oh. And of course, we know now that's not the case. <laughs> you know, the world of publishing has changed a lot since then. But even then, I kind of proved that wrong because I did both um, and I've never written for a newspaper. Um, so, but I'd still say that the journalism training was helpful mm -hmm. because it really helped me zero in on the most important aspects of a story. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they teach you to look for the who, what, when, where, why, and how, mm -hmm. um, and also to kind of organize your thoughts in a logical manner. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's helped me to, with my story flow. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> so what were some of your early inspirations for writing? Okay, um, well, um, I'd say probably the the history of Georgia. Usually it's little known history mm -hmm. and sometimes even legends of an area. Mm -hmm. um, those tend to inspire me. That's what happened with this book, The Witness Tree. Um, it's set in Northwest Georgia. It was then Cherokee Territory. And it's about the Moravian missionaries that come down from Salem, North Carolina, and they um, start a school for Cherokee children on the plantation of Chief James Van. Mm -hmm. um, so in my story, you have a marriage of convenience that happens, and then the wife has an assignment not only to teach the children mm -hmm. <clears throat> at the uh, school, but also another assignment that ends up getting her in trouble, mm -hmm. um, set around 1805. But um, that is um, one example. And then I'd say... Um, Sometimes the time period mm -hmm. interests me. Um, I originally started with the Georgia Gold series, and it's set in the mid-1800s. Salty Shadows starts in the time of the Georgia Gold Rush and the mm -hmm. Cherokee removal, and you follow about four families through the Civil War and Reconstruction in Brightest Gold. Um, this is historical fiction, and I really enjoyed writing that time period, but then <clears throat> I began to gravitate, I'd say, more towards colonial mm -hmm. due to some blogging I was mm -hmm. doing online. I blog with Colonial Quills blog mm -hmm. and Heroes, Heroines in History. Mm -hmm. And we ended up having this book come out, The Backcountry Bride, which is set in the 1700s. 
Um, but after that, I kind of, I guess, came to the realization that for Georgia, um, mm-hmm. I like frontier, you know, mm-hmm. time period and all the challenges that living on the frontier would have brought mm-hmm. the early settlers. So um, I came to realize that the late 1700s and early 1800s was really more that time period for mm-hmm. Georgia and a lot of the Southeast. So now I've kind of parked myself in the federal period. Nice. That's not written about as much. It isn't. So it's a little bit different. Some people don't know exactly what the Federalist period is. So if anyone out there is not completely sure what the Federalist period is, it is the period where the Federalists, which was a political party, had control of the United States uh government, basically. Um, you have the, the President's Federalist, the House and Senate are Federalist, so it's called the Federalist era because there's a lot of Federalist ideas that are getting pushed through at the very start of the nation, which mm-hmm. is, again, the end <laughs> of the seven, 1790s mm-hmm. to early 1800s. Right. And it corresponded, of course, with the Regency time period in England. Yes. And everybody <laughs> reading romances, you know, they know about Regency romances, mm-hmm. but Thanks here in America, Jane Austen. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and I just get ideas for stories um, kind of randomly too, mm-hmm. really. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll get you know, blocked when I'm trying to actually think of what I want to happen next. Mm-hmm. And I'm during my office hours sitting at my desk. Um, but then I'll just take a walk, you mm-hmm. know, have a change of scenery. Or sometimes after work and I'm washing my dishes or whatever, and I'll get this light bulb idea, you know, for the next scene. So that's just kind of how it works for me. <laughs> So when you were younger, what were some books that you just loved that made you want to write like that? Well, I have to admit, one of the first big historical books I read was Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I read it in middle school, a lot on the school bus. I read it after school because it was a really long school bus ride. Um, I (laughs) read to finish Gone with the Wind. (laughs) Yes. I was very young to be reading it and people looked at me really funny. Mm -hmm. But um, I also, my parents got me reading Eugenia Price during that time period and her Georgia books. So that kind of inspired the Georgia Gold series, but also a lot of classic authors, of course, as well. So so, uh, tell us about like the moment an idea strikes, like what is that like for you? Uh, What are you inspired by the idea, an event, a specific character, and then how does that Mm -hmm. idea become a book? Okay, so I, I think I talked a little bit about like when an idea strikes or kind of where I get my inspiration. Mm-hmm. But like after that happens, the next thing I'll do, um, I actually start with, we'll start thinking about my characters pretty early mm-hmm. in the process. And I like to research several things to create a believable character. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would include like the era, the time period, mm-hmm. the area they mm-hmm. live in, um, their ethnicity, their mm-hmm. education, because all those things would factor into their personality mm-hmm. and what their life would have been like. And then out of those things, you'd usually find out, you know, how they might have spoken, mm-hmm. uh, what kind of occupation they might have had. Mm-hmm. I prefer to, you know, for the most part, make a really believable character who would be an accurate reflection of that time period. You can write a character that's just, you know, totally breaking the mold, mm-hmm. but you really need to have a good reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, you know, having a Civil War um, doctor who's a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was possible, but it was rare. So you'd need Dr. to show. Dr. Mary Walker. Yes. <laughs> is pretty much the only one that we have accurate uh, accounts of. So it's possible, but yes. very rare. Right. <laughs> um, so after I do that, like about the same time, I'm kind of working on my characters and I, I even name them, you know, historically, I've been known to look through um, genealogical records mm-hmm. and census records to get good names. Okay. But um, after I do that, I also start researching, usually start mm-hmm. online. Then that, that kind of leads to me ordering books, whether it's from Amazon or um, the library mm-hmm. and I'll read and as I'm doing that I start creating a timeline mm-hmm. and just a word document and it can get really long because <laughs> I'll plug in anything that I think would be you know mm-hmm. pertinent to this story and I will then start watching videos online you know mm-hmm. YouTube videos of people doing things um, I'll interview experts. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Um, Something that has to do with the story that I don't know enough about, you know, Mm -hmm. do that. And of course, I really love taking historical trips Mm -hmm. (laughs) and having an excuse, whether it's a day trip or a weekend trip and Mm -hmm. taking somebody with me. And um, that's a lot of fun. So I just add everything, all my notes into Mm -hmm. one document. And I try to include my sources because Mm -hmm. I'll often blog from that later. Mm -hmm. 
and I even throw in pictures, um, paintings that may inspire my story mm -hmm. or give me an accurate representation of clothing, um, and maps. I especially love mm -hmm. maps um, because I'm just a visual person, I guess, mm -hmm. and they help me envision um, whether you're in a town or a fort or say a character's traveling, mm -hmm. it lets you know like, you know, how long is it going to take them? What mountains, rivers are they mm -hmm. going to cross? Um, it just helps you to be accurate yeah. in your story. So once I've got that framework, um, the historical framework, then I start to weave my fictional story and I mm -hmm. plot it out and I kind of um, allow usually the big things that happen in history mm -hmm. to be major climaxes or turning points in the story. Mm -hmm. So can you introduce us to your newest book and kind of walk us through sure. what was the research process like for this book in particular? Mm -hmm. uh, did you get to take any trips? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but what was it like? And uh, can you tell us some of the major mm -hmm. historical events, how you wove your story into it? All Of, of all course. Of I'm really excited about this. A Bent Tree Bride. I don't have the books yet. Um, I've ordered my author copies, but they're not here yet. But thankfully, I got the table sign. Yes. <laughs> um, so you can at least see the image. <clears throat> but it is set in 1813 and 1814 um, on the... Um, in what's now Alabama. Okay. It was then Creek Territory. So that's where it's set for the most part. And it's about a Cherokee lieutenant. Well, he's half Cherokee. And he falls in love with his colonel's daughter mm -hmm. during the War of 1812. A lot of people don't know that the uh, Red Stick War, mm -hmm. um, which occurred in Alabama, was part of the War of 1812. The Creek Indians were allied with the British, and the Cherokees were allied with um, the Americans under Andrew Jackson. So um, it was really neat, you know, to learn the history of the Cherokee Regiment. Mm -hmm. To research it, um, I did like everything I pretty much just described. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of the special things I did, I watched YouTube videos mm -hmm. of knife fighting and tomahawk throwing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of strange. But um, <laughs> you, the Cherokees were uh, very skilled with the use of the tomahawk in, mm -hmm. in battle. So... Um, I did that, and then I got to go to the battle, um, what's well, actually a living history, mm -hmm. where the Battle of Horseshoe Bend occurred mm -hmm. in Alabama. Mm -hmm. It's a couple years ago. Okay. And that gave me the opportunity to um, talk with living historians and take pictures and actually see, like, the layout of the land. That helps you so much mm -hmm. to just get the feel for the way it smells, the way it feels, mm -hmm. you know, how far things were apart. Yeah. So that was fun. So how long does it normally take you to write a book? We, there's so many back here. It seems... Right. <clears throat> well, I've gotten faster at it. Um, this series, I researched for a full year before I ever started writing. Mm -hmm. Then I kept researching as I was going. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being about... Well, there's four books, but probably four-year time period, mm -hmm. something like that. I'm not even sure now. But um, this one was kind of a little miracle because I actually researched and wrote it in six weeks. Mm -hmm. So that was the fastest I've ever researched and written anything. That's so very pretty quick. <laughs> happy with that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is Women's History Month. A lot of the characters in your books are, in fact, women, mm -hmm. uh, different historical heroines. So how do you yep. go about creating a historical heroine? Okay. And how do you choose... The personality, choose mm -hmm. their, their look, choose their attitudes. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, based on the story, of course, it, it will vary. Um, I like to include different types of heroines. Sometimes mm -hmm. I have just a really strong heroine who's just determined and she's able to kind of rise to the challenges around her. Um, some of my heroines are maybe a little more, they have a little more to overcome. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe they have something that's happened in their past that makes them insecure um, about themselves or about life. Um, and maybe there's a weakness, you know, that they need to work on. Mm -hmm. So I like to write heroines that kind of have a growth arc. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, you may see like some flaws and some struggles. And as the heroine meets the challenges before her, she grows as a person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like the modern reader to be able to identify with the heroine because even though we have different challenges now, we still have a lot of the same issues. The, know, the in human our lives. condition. <laughs> yeah, and within ourselves or just within our relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, I just try to make, make the hero, heroines relatable. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered the question. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So um, how has your writing process changed over the years? You've talked about that a little mm -hmm. bit. Of it. It's, you know, shorter now, but uh, you've also have become an editor. Mm -hmm. And how has that 
changed the way that you look at writing right. and look at books? Well, I guess a couple different ways. Um, when I first started, I would tend to write just based on the flow and just mm -hmm. let it kind of go where it needed to. Um, now I'd say I plot my books out more. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to avoid any sagging parts, you know, where nothing's mm -hmm. moving forward, either internally or externally. Mm -hmm. You want to keep the reader turning pages. So I do create more of a, a plot outline now. Mm -hmm. I still try to leave room for the characters to have their own voice or like minor changes to occur. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's different. And then I would also say that being an editor has probably made me um, faster. Well, I'd say definitely, <laughs> judging from that. Oh, yeah. Um, just to to kind of catch things up front and edit myself as I go. And um, anyway, yeah, I, I feel like it's easier for me to cut words now mm -hmm. than to expand. And that's the opposite oh, wow, of how it yeah. used to be. Um, I recently wrote um, another historical set in the same time period as Bent Tree Bride. And it's called A Secondhand Betrothal. Mm -hmm. And it's set in Jackson County, mm -hmm. in parts of what's now Gwinnett County. Um, that story is with my agent now. But I came up with 73,000 words, and I thought I had done well because yeah. I wrote it just like Bent Tree Bride over the holiday in January. Company was coming, you know, all the holiday things going on. We even got sick, you know, all this stuff was happening. But mm -hmm. I finished this book, and then she said, well, we really need 80,000 words for a large publisher. They prefer, mm -hmm. you know, it to be a big historical novel. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, no, <laughs> where am I going to find 7,000 words? But thankfully, um, mm -hmm. I think you're on my um, beta reading team online <laughs> and she Maria has done some beta reading for me in the past so a beta reader is somebody that will read your story before it even goes to your agent mm -hmm. to um, look for little bloopers or you know things that are confusing mm -hmm. and in this case they helped me find 7,000 words oh nice <laughs> thank <Fantastic>. goodness <laughs> yeah so where do you well how long do you think most of your books would be um lengthwise in, lengthwise um almost all of them are 75,000 to some of these may be 85. Mm -hmm. 80 is a pretty good average. 80,000 right. words. Mm -hmm. So what are, so if, if anyone is wanting to be a writer out there, 80,000 words is a <laughs> <laughs> Sound <novel>. challenging. <laughs> um, so do you have any advice for people who, any budding writers out there, any people sure. who have had this dream of writing a book? Can you share <laughs> some of your experience about not just writing, uh, writing but also that journey of getting published as mm -hmm. well so advice yeah. for writers on their writing yeah. and publishing journey okay yeah there's there's a lot i could say <laughs> i don't know how many writers are out there but i'll just um maybe speak to two two of the things mm -hmm. and these are things that i um often will see that are issues mm -hmm. to having a new author become published and reasons i might turn away a manuscript mm -hmm. in my position with the publishing house um, one of the first things, it's important to be aware of trends in publishing. Mm -hmm. When I first started um, with the Georgia Gold series, and just as I was growing up and reading books, mm -hmm. the style was more, um, I would say, narrative viewpoint, kind of literary fiction. The family sagas were popular. Mm -hmm. um, and in that style, you have you know multiple viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of hopping from different heads throughout the characters in the story. Um, you have that narrator that's kind of like a middleman or a voice mm -hmm. that is telling the reader what the character feels. Like, you know, he said, she gasped, um, he wondered, she thought, you know, that kind of thing was mm -hmm. very common. Now, all that's changed. Mm -hmm. And it really was changing when I was writing the Restoration Trilogy there behind mm -hmm. you. That's the split time um, series. Mm -hmm. So some modern, some historical in there. But um, I had to learn deep point of view. Mm -hmm. Most major publishers, especially for romance, mm -hmm. prefer it now. So it's more his and her point of view, and it's you know generally 50-50. It may mm -hmm. be 60-40 in favor of the heroine, mm -hmm. um, but it's very immersive. So you're, as a writer, you're putting the reader in the character's head. Mm -hmm. So you can only share what that character in that moment thinks, feels, smells, knows, and you can't go outside that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a very different writing style. And I'd say if you're not familiar with that, the change does not occur overnight. Um, mm -hmm. It took me some time <laughs> <laughs> to master that change. And um, it's good to, you know, order a book on it, take a class mm -hmm. on it, um, and maybe have a critique partner who's experienced with that and can help you. 
The other thing I'd mention is it's very important, even for um, even if you're going with a large publisher mm -hmm. and you're a debut author, they want to see you have um, an online presence. Mm -hmm. So that would include probably a website and at least two platforms where you have a substantial following. And a lot of people wonder, well, how do I get that before mm -hmm. I've even published a book? And it definitely is harder, but there are ways to do it. And I won't go into that, but if anybody has a question, you can post post that question. Um, and um, then also some people will self-publish mm -hmm. and that's a wonderful route for a number of people. I have friends who are very prolific <clears throat> and make a lot more money than I do self-publishing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good way to do it, but you just do have to be aware as you're starting out, it's important to make sure your story is well edited mm -hmm. and that you market it well, because if you ever want to be published traditionally, your publisher is still going to want to see your online presence and they're going to want to see that you've sold that book. They're going to look at your sales numbers. Mm -hmm. So a couple different things that I think it's important for a budding author to be aware of. Yes. And now where can we buy your books? Okay. Um, well, you can read more about them on my website. Um, I don't know if we can put that up. We can't. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Actually, the website is changing this month. The oh. webs is going away. So if you take out the webs, you'll find me. That will be there through the end of March. Either one is fine for now. But um, yeah, you can Google me and read about all my books. I have um, contemporaries here as well. Um, so if you like contemporary, I have some suspense. Um, check those out online. They're all on Amazon, mm -hmm. on print and ebook, except maybe we were just discussing these are older. The first two may not be on print on Amazon. Um, my more recent novels, you can order directly from my publisher at shoplpc.com. Um, and also, there are folks that would just prefer to go into their local bookstore. And if it's a chain bookstore, big or small, and they order through Ingram, they can get them in for you there. All right. Awesome. Yep. All right. So I think that that's uh, all of my questions that I have here. So now let's take it to the chat uh, and see what questions that we have that we can answer for y'all. All right. Hello, everyone. Libba here from behind the scenes. And we have some excellent questions. Ooh. So um, first of all, we uh, just to clarify, so are most of your books targeted toward uh, young readers or adults? Have you gone into um, young reader fiction before? Oh. Uh, just explain what drew you to your specific genre. And also okay. what genre you would consider all of these. Okay. There's actually several questions in that, that yeah. <laughs> and all good ones. Um, so most of my books are for adults. Mm -hmm. They are clean, so they are okay for teenagers as well. Um, I actually have one book here that I would say pushed into the new adult category, mm -hmm. Spring Splash. It's a sports fiction romance. It's one of my contemporaries, of course. But um, because the uh, main character is in college, mm -hmm. and so new adult is kind of, you know, that step above young adult. Mm -hmm. So that's one um, that would kind of answer that question. Um, I have, most of mine are historical romance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know the difference between historical fiction and historical romance. Um, I was surprised. I was talking to somebody just the other day, mm -hmm. and they said, I never knew that. It was one of my friends. Oh. <laughs> so um, basically, historical fiction it's a little bit more like the narrative point of view in mm -hmm. that you can have multiple points of view. There may be a romance. There may not. It, mm -hmm. The main plot or point of the story can be something completely different. But if there is a romance, it's like a subplot. Mm -hmm. Whereas with historical romance, the romance is the main focus of the story, how it unfolds and the challenges the couple faces. So um, I'm a historical romance and historical fiction editor. Mm -hmm. I'd say this is more historical fiction, the series. And then most of the others are historical romance. And then I have contemporary romance. And this one, Traces, set in Atlanta, is romantic suspense. Okay. So I've done a little bit of that. And split time, or um, some people call it dual time period. I mentioned that earlier. The Restoration Trilogy, which is where they were doing a restoration of a house and a doctor's office and an apothecary shop and a log cabin. And they uncover kind of um, some historical mysteries as mm -hmm. they're doing that. So I wove history into that one, too. <laughs> I, I have read multiple of these, but uh, I enjoyed this one a lot because the main character, the heroine, is a student at the University of Georgia doing yep. the historic preservation <laughs> program. And while I was reading it, I was also at the University of Georgia and also in the historic preservation <laughs> program. Uh, so, and it's awesome. it's. Uh, 
very you do everything right with historic preservation. I know you have a background in that as as well. Some interest in yeah. that, and, and my father was very knowledgeable about architecture. And they were actually restoring a historic um, doctor's house and apothecary shop outside Athens. That was the inspiration for that series. So I learned a lot from him. I followed him around as he was doing stuff, and I'm like, "What are you doing now, Dad?" And it was fun. <laughs> Uh, Karen has a family member who is uh, also interested in writing and is currently writing. Um, okay. But she would she would love to take you up on that offer of advice about um, getting started before you have something published. So okay. what kind of content can authors generate before they actually publish a book? Okay. I jotted down some thoughts about that, so I don't leave anything out. Um, go ahead and set up a website. And I know a lot of people that will... There are several things you can do with that website. You can blog or you know write articles as you're researching. So if you're doing a historical, you might include um, stories about where you've gone to research, pictures, topics that tie into the book you're researching, kind of make it like a historical themed or whatever topic your book is about. Like you may be writing about um, you know, somebody in a certain trade, you could mm -hmm. post a series of articles about that and interview experts. Um, another thing a lot of people will do is um, to review books for other authors. Mm -hmm. Authors are always eager to take you up on that, you know, and whether it's just to highlight their book and include a, a little blurb about it in a link um, or to actually do a Q&A with an author, um, to have the art author post a guest um, article, that's a good thing. And you can host guest blogs of different types. Mm -hmm. So those are several things that I know people have done successfully and really grown their following online. Giveaways too. <laughs> like giveaways. People always like giveaways. Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, Carol is um, wondering, how does someone become a beta reader? Is it just a matter of happening to have a connection to the author? Or can mm -hmm. you, is this something you can sign up and become a beta reader for authors? How does that work? Yeah, you, you can. Um, the way I tend to select beta readers is um, through connections online for the most part. I'm very active on Facebook mm -hmm. and I have a private author's launch team um, where sometimes I'll put out a call. I've done that in the past. I think that's how like I asked mm -hmm. you, but um, and I'll just say I need some more people on my launch team. And that means on my launch team, I have beta readers. And that's kind of a separate thing. They may just beta read. And then I will also have people who help with the launch of the book. And they will help create social media buzz. They will post reviews. They will share, you know, when I post, like I'm doing something like this. They'll share the link, you know, just to help get the word out. Um, so that's just invaluable to an author. But we kind of look to see, you know, who really enjoys our books. Like we want to make sure that you actually do like our writing. So you're going to say good things about it when when our book comes out. Um, and I'll just, you know, sometimes open up my launch team for folks. So connect with me online if you love history and uh, whatever authors you're reading. I'd say, if, you know, if you're not into that sort of um, genre find authors and, and follow them online and maybe send them a message and ask about it, most authors will respond graciously. Are there any um, Northeast Georgia or um, online writing groups that you can recommend to our audience today? Oh, um, for authors, budding authors or? Online writing groups. Online writing groups. Yeah. Nothing's come into my mind right at the moment. I'm but it's sorry. probably a good idea for folks to to yeah. join groups that yeah. that the, you do find on Facebook. So mm -hmm. um, I know that Facebook. There's also mm -hmm. meetups as well. So yeah, there's um, a lot of Facebook groups. If yeah. you're a budding author, you could just search and find them. Yeah, I'd say in your area of interest. Uh, Lindsay just has a comment that says, uh, I'm just starting publishing, so definitely appreciate the advice. Oh, <laughs> so thank you, Lindsay. You're most welcome. <laughs> and uh, Joe Lee is wondering, did you do any research into Elias Boudinot, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and yes. Harriet Gold for Bentry Bride or any of your other work? Um, yes, I think um, Elias Boudinot more for the witness tree. Um, so for those of us who don't know who those people are, would you could you give us a okay, little Okay, Harriet background? Gold, that's not ringing a bell for me at the moment. I so. believe that's his wife. Okay. Yes. Oh, interesting. Um, oh, goodness. My brain is just going totally blank. <laughs> so Elias. He's, he was one of the um, Cherokee. Um, that's correct. He was, a, he was a leader of the Cherokee yeah. Nation, also a writer and a newspaper editor. 
He was the editor of the Cherokee Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's men- it's not really mentioned in the witness tree, and that's why it wasn't ringing a bell. I knew, I'm like, I know who he is, but it's not coming to my mind. <laughs> Panic. But um, this is set in 1805, so it's before um, all that was happening at New Echota right. and their and their town when they established their newspaper. So yeah, right. So this is a, a little bit before a little bit uh, different period. Yeah. Yes, a little bit after. Yeah. Let's see, our next question comes from uh, Miriam. <laughs> Miriam would like to know which books of yours uh, includes Gwinnett County? Oh, <laughs> that's um, my hometown. Yeah, <laughs> so the Gwinnett County. I'm thinking none of these have Gwinnett County. The one I mentioned that I just finished writing that went to my agent, mm-hmm. it is set around Fort Daniel, which Marie and I went to a living history last fall Mm -hmm. Um, and her mom came and we had a really good time. (laughs) Um, I didn't even realize there was a war of 1812 fort that Mm -hmm. was so close to us. Um, At that time period, it was Jackson County. It was on the very tip of Jackson County and it abutted like Creek territory and Cherokee territory, Mm -hmm. Creek to the South, Cherokee to the North. Um, So it was like the farthest Western outpost during that time Mm -hmm. period. Um, So, of course, that fascinated me. Um, So my next book, my next historical that should be coming after this one, Lord willing, (laughs) is um, technically that's now Gwinnett County (laughs) Um, and Jackson County, which is where I grew up. So that's kind of neat. This one includes Wilkes County um, and the Battle of Kettle Creek during the Revolutionary War, which is near Washington, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So. Do you have any that, uh, since the Northeast Georgia History Center is in Hall County, do we have any that would fall more into that line? Not particularly Hall. This mm-hmm. one is kind of the whole, you know, North Georgia region, Sauté, Clarksville, okay. and then Savannah. Um, I believe Gainesville, you know, that area is mm-hmm. mentioned kind mm-hmm. of in the general when they're traveling around and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. Um, all of And down to Atlanta during the Civil War. So it's kind of a, a broader area and time period for that one. Yeah. Great. Our next question comes from Lindsay, and Lindsay asks, do you have any tips for not getting lost in the research and knowing when you have uh-uh. enough for a framework? <laughs> that is such a good question. <laughs> Especially for, I almost talked about that earlier, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> that was really hard for me at first, and I kind of said I got stalled on research with the Georgia Gold Series, so I had to learn how to like pare that down and to know when I had enough. Um, you just kind of learn by doing it, I guess. And it's important to learn, too, how to incorporate it in your story so that it's not overwhelming to the reader, so that the history is mixed into the story. I really like to do that through action beats, you know, which you would use instead of a speaker tag. You have a, a character who's saying something, and then in that same paragraph, they're doing something. And that's a great time to interject what the lady's wearing, you know, and what, how she's making butter, and, you know, what the next step is and whatever she's doing. Um, so that's one way I love to include the history and of course you know just little bits here and there about the setting and so forth Um, in terms of stopping I don't don't know how to say like when to stop researching I I guess I feel like when I have a good average amount and I I kind of think ahead about what topics are going to be really important to my story Mm -hmm. and I'll try to get extra on that and I'll add paragraphs at the end of my timeline Um, say if it's about like fashion or it's about travel by steamship you know Mm -hmm. i'll have two or three paragraphs about that of research from more than one source usually you know several sources after my timeline and when i'm writing that particular scene that involves that i can go to that paragraph and that's my starting point for research so i hope that helps a little bit (laughs) yeah and uh laurie's curious how did you get artist john colic to illustrate (laughs) your early work did the publisher handle that (laughs) No, <laughs> that is, that's so neat. You recognize John Colick's work, and I should have said something about that. John Colick was my mentor um, that really got me started writing. When I lived in Habersham County for 10 years, we raised our girls there for the most part and then moved to the Athens area. Um, now we're further south, but um, John Colick um, had read one of my early novellas, which I don't have on the table, Redeeming Grace. And he had told me if I wanted help with my research Mm -hmm. um, to let him know in the future. And at that point, I kind of wanted to write something about Georgia, um, North Georgia, during the Mm mid-1800s, because I didn't feel like there was anything like that out there. Mm -hmm. And so I took him up on the offer, and I went to his house outside Clarksville. Mm -hmm. Um, The premise behind the Georgia Gold series is that 
people from the coast built summer homes outside Clarksville, Georgia to get away from yellow fever. And his family was among those that did that. So I got to see the last surviving um, summer house outside Clarksville and he lent me his family letters and diaries oh, for my wow. research, which was a huge gift. Um, and then he um, designed my covers and I worked with him directly. The publisher, they were not involved in that. So I actually have the prints that he made Whoa. of each of these beautiful covers, which um, are in my office now at home on the wall right behind my desk. And his name alone just opened a lot of doors yeah. as I began to write because people knew, you know, that he was um, such a wonderful historical artist mm -hmm. and wonderful historian from North Georgia. So uh, that's how that came about. And um, my first several signings, he and his wife would come and he would sign the books with me. So I really miss his presence in my life. <laughs> Uh, Trisha would love to know the titles of, of the books on the table. I know, I know you've got quite a few. But, yeah, um, let's just go could, through. Yeah, if you could just give us maybe like a very brief, you know, mm -hmm. teaser premise of, of each of them. Yeah. Okay. So I've talked a lot about this. I have Salty Shadows, The Gray Divide, The Crimson Bloom, and Bright as Gold. And online, when you go to order them, they'll be numbered. And they say on the front cover, book one, two, three, four. Um, the Witness Tree, my most recently released historical. Um, the Bent Tree Bride, which is coming in April. You can pre-order it now, and we should have a link for that, I think, at the end. Yeah. Um, you can pre-order it now, and it will be sent to you. It releases April 13th. Um, Backcountry Brides, it's a collection of eight novellas from the 1700s about strong women on the frontier um, who are facing challenges and finding love. Mine is the one set in Georgia. <laughs> During the Revolutionary War, um, that's a great collection. And then the the Restoration Trilogy, I have White, Widow, and Witch. Those titles have to do with something about the historical heroine and the time period they lived in. No, they're not scary. <laughs> I, people always ask me, is it scary? And I'm like, no, it's, it's really not scary. Um, then I have the contemporary titles, Traces, which I mentioned um, set in Atlanta, um, it's um, got a hunted theme. It's about a reality TV show gone wrong and a young lady who works for a, a public relations, she works in public relations for a surveillance technology company. So her insider knowledge actually puts her at risk as she's doing what she thinks is just a reality TV show. Then I have Fall Flip. This has probably been my most popular um, contemporary romance. Set in Augusta, have a little history mixed in because mm -hmm. Um, the young widow is having to get a new contractor to help her restore a bungalow, a 1920s bungalow in Augusta. And they find out there's something that happened in the house that if it comes out, it could kind of sideline the career she's trying to resurrect because she used to have a TV uh, flipping business. And then Spring Splash was inspired, it's very dear to my heart. It was inspired by um, 15 years as a swim mom. Both of my daughters swam competitively for a long time and um, trained in Athens. Mm -hmm. So it's about an injured college swimmer who falls for a special needs swim team and their coach. Um, and then last of all, this is an independently published little novel. It's a novella called A Holiday Heart. It just came out this past Christmas. It's part of the Georgia Peaches series. Um, so this is just a nice little quick read um, set in kind of the Clayton and Dillard area and Raven Gap area during the holidays. So, nice. I hope that covered it. Yes, yeah. perfect. <laughs> now, um, we have Karen is asking, has your research led to you producing maybe other content for your blog, like how-to tutorials or historic recipes or anything uh, like yeah. that outside of your work? Okay. Um, I don't actually blog on my website. That's just something I've chosen because of time management and mainly because now as an editor, the majority of my time actually goes into my editing jobs. I also freelance in addition to working for the publishing house. Um, so that's been, been my sideline focus. I do guest blog regularly, especially when a book is releasing. I'll do articles that um, are spinoffs or related topics for um, that story. And then once a month on each of the blogs I mentioned, Colonial Quills and Heroes, Heroines, and History, I will blog mainly about the history behind the novels that I've written mm -hmm. and the research I'm currently doing. Um, and then I also have an author newsletter on my website. Once a month, I send out an email and I'll tend to put in it um, sometimes recipes, like historical recipes. Um, 
sneak peeks of like if I'm going on a research trip. Mm -hmm. I just, my next one is going to talk about, um, I went into a glass blower studio mm -hmm. and was learning how to glass blow. So that was really cool for my next contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, giveaways, excerpts, book cover reveals. That's the sort of thing I do in my newsletter. So if you're interested in that kind of little inside knowledge, please sign up. There's a link on my website. Should be. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. New website. <laughs> and uh, oh, this is a good question. Do you have any advice for parents who are also interested in writing? How do you balance uh, parenting oh. and writing? Yeah. <laughs> I did that for so many years. And um, now I have my own office, but that's only happened in the last year mm -hmm. since we've made our last move. And before that, just saying, I, I got you because like, I know exactly the struggle. I would write from the island in my kitchen mm -hmm. and that wasn't a very good place. Like I had to wait until my husband's gone to work, mm -hmm. the girls are gone to school, and then that would be my writing time. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever read um, as a young mom and a writer, aspiring writer, was to not feel guilty about doing the things that you can do while they're around, like save those things, make them part of those things, like sweeping, cooking, you know, cleaning. It's okay to put that off and give yourself the time to write while they're with a sitter or with your mom or at school. Um, it's harder now, I'm sure, with a lot of folks that have kids home with mm -hmm. Corona. Um, I can't even imagine. I think we, I did a lot of trade-offs with mm -hmm. my husband, you know, and say, okay, you take them now for several hours, it's writing time. And we would do that. Um, my mom <laughs> kept the girls, you know, sometimes when I needed special time, that's the way to do it. But um, mainly the, the main thing I really um, applied was to just let myself have permission to sit down and consider it a career, consider it this is my job and be OK with that. Do it, you know, and then when the kids are at home and around, do the other things that you can do around your house or run your errands or whatever. Oh, great advice. Uh, Lori is curious, are you a member of the Georgia Romance Writers chapter of the Romance Writers of America or perhaps <laughs> other organizations you could recommend? I'm actually not. Um, <laughs> this Fall Flip was a finalist in the Faith, Hope and Love um, this last year. It was the Romance Writers of America Faith, Hope and Love category. It was one of the finalists. Um, I have not joined them, just haven't followed through on that. There's so many things you can become a a member of. I'm a member of the American Christian Fiction Writers, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the main organization that I have been paying dues to and keeping up with. There's a lot of um, opportunities you get through their email loop and um, through their website and their newsletter. I'm trying to think, there may be one or two other smaller ones, but that's the main one I do. And uh, <laughs> Laura is wondering, how does an author or publisher decide whether or not to produce the book as an audiobook? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, and I have news about that also. <laughs> this book is going to audiobook Yay. see it um, as we speak. Um, so that's the first. That will be my first book. And that happened. It can happen a couple different ways. Um, if you have massive sales, a an audiobook company may approach your publisher and say, "I would like to have the rights to put this book on audiobook." But I'm not to that point yet. Most authors aren't. You have to be just big name. You sell so many copies for that to happen. And if that happens, they'll give you an advance and then you'll get a percentage. Um, another way you can do it is through, um, oh my goodness, the name of the company is going to evade me right now. But um, there is a company, there are probably more than one that will have, that will pair the narrators with the authors and or the publishers. And it was really neat because there is a, a friend that I remembered from Habersham mm -hmm. um, that I had met her there, a reader and a, a lady who um, lives in Habersham County who has gotten into this. She actually narrates for newspapers mm -hmm. and she contacted me and wanted to um, know about could she do the reading? She wants to get into fiction books. And so we connected, my publisher connected through the company, I think it's ACX, that's the name of it. Um, so she works for ACX and they connect with the publisher. And so now she's putting it on tape. I haven't heard it yet. So I'm looking forward to that. And awesome. probably Fall Flip, I would guess, would be the next one after The Witness Tree. Wonderful. Um, well, folks, uh, in the chat, we do have a few more minutes left. So if you do have any questions, feel free to chat those. But uh, now I think it would be a great time. We'd love to hear an excerpt from okay. uh, Bent Tree Bride. Yeah, that would be great. Let me get a little sip here. <laughs> 
All right. Um, I guess the first thing I should do is to read the back cover copy. I, I didn't do that earlier. Um, it tells in a nutshell more about the book. Susanna Moore can't get him out of her mind. The learned lieutenant who delivered the commission from Andrew Jackson, making her father colonel of the Cherokee Regiment. But the next time she sees Lieutenant Sam Hicks, he's leading a string of prisoners into a frontier fort, and he's wearing the garb of a Cherokee scout rather than the suit of a white gentleman. As both Susanna's father and Sam's commanding officer, Colonel Moore couldn't have made his directive to stay away from his daughter clearer to Sam. He wants a better match for Susanna, like the stuffy doctor who escorted her to Creek Territory. <clears throat> then a suspected spy forces Moore to rely on Sam for military intelligence and Susanna's protection, making it impossible for either to guard their heart. <laughs> Okay, and the excerpt I'm about to share, um, and I think we'll be having up, up on the screen the cover again while I'm reading it, but um, Sam Hicks is um, has been just assigned by his colonel to guard not only the colonel's daughter, but also his younger son while they are at Fort Struther in Hostile Creek Territory. And Susanna and George, the younger brother, have talked Sam into demonstrating tomahawk and knife throwing at the practice range. So that's what's happening as I'm going to read this little bit. <clears throat> Susanna's speaking first, but we're in Sam's point of view. What is your other requirement? What? Sam snatched his gaze from Susanna's lips to her eyes. Her cheeks, already rosy in the cold, darkened another shade. For letting me throw your little bitty knife. My little bitty knife? Indignation laced his repetition of her words. Let there be no doubt, this dagger could gut a man. Very well, your lethal weapon, although you seem to think I can't handle the larger one, much less the tomahawk. Why do you care about throwing a knife or a tomahawk or any weapon when your father would order his entire regiment to fight to protect you? Susanna released a gusty sigh. Because as much as I would like to think he will always be there, he may not. What if I lose him in battle? What if this lung sickness returns when he goes out on the next campaign and Polly can't save him? Then what will I have left? For one, Dr. Hawkins would rush to the rescue, although Sam would be wiser to bite his tongue than suggest that when she was this betwaddled. Thankfully, she continued without pausing to solicit any answers. I should at least be able to defend myself. The lessons at finishing school may have taught me how to speak French and snare a husband, but they are useless out here. You know he will send you home at the first opportunity. As much as the thought pained him, Fort Struther would seem a cheerless place without Susanna Moore. But that's just it. I shouldn't have to leave. She balled her hands into fists at her sides. I want to show him I am as strong as Polly, that I can survive and not only survive, but be helpful on the frontier. I don't have to have Cherokee blood to do that, do I? The yearning for acceptance in Susanna's words echoed a similar longing in Sam's heart. She searched his eyes as she had earlier, but this time he didn't close his soul. If she needed strength and he could help give it to her, what cause had he to deny her? Just a little taste. <laughs> oh, lovely. Now I'm curious. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, uh, we have uh, one more question for you, Denise, and that's for okay. for younger writers. So uh, mm -hmm. Karen has a Girl Scout in her family, and one of their badges is the novel badge. Oh, uh, wow. So, that's do you have? Yeah. yeah. So for for younger writers, how can parents encourage that interest in in perhaps history or writing or both uh, for mm -hmm. their younger younger kids? Yeah, um, I guess just like my parents did, um, just be flexible and willing to take them to places that inspire them where they can learn history, preferably in a hands-on manner with living history that will bring to life. Yeah, like the like the Northeast Georgia, Georgia History, history Center. Center. <laughs> my parents took me to a lot of living history events and reenactments um, as I was, and, and they did that just to support me because I wanted to, I felt like it was to like inspire my writing. Mm -hmm. And it really did. Um, I learned a lot of um, first person, you know, mm -hmm. facts behind things. And um, then I guess, you know, be patient to listen to them, their stories as they're developing and, you know, find the things that are their strengths and encourage those, you know, about their writing and maybe see if you can get them um, to, pair up with a, an author who's published or, you know, farther along in the journey that can help mentor them. Um, I've, you know, done that with a couple of younger ladies and um, it's really rewarding on both ends to, to have that opportunity. 
Well, thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for coming today, for telling us about all of your, your books, your writing process, the research that goes into them. I know there's so much research that goes into every single one of these. Yeah. Um, and if you read them, you will certainly see it. It, it definitely shows that your, your you. vast historical knowledge in the, in the oh. books themselves. So thank you so much for coming. Thank it's you for a- having me. Absolutely. I've really appreciated the opportunity and I hope to connect with some of you out there on social media and, um, mm-hmm in the future. So So I've got your website in the chat. Is there anywhere else we should, uh, any social media that we should follow Um, you on as well? Well, I'm on Facebook and Twitter are my main two. Also BookBub, if you do that, Goodreads, you can find me on all of those. Um, And then sign up for the newsletter that comes once a month. That's a good thing to do because as we can see, social media can change, you know, and you know, may not always have that connection. So it's good to have that email connection too. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Denise. Thank, thank you, Marie, you. for hosting. And thank you to thank all of our viewers Marie. for watching today. All right. Till next time. Thank you. Bye.